Tonight, launch director Charlie Blackwell Thompson has called a scrub for today. The highly anticipated launch of NASA's moon rocket never took off for its debut test flight. The launch ran into multiple problems this morning, including a weather delay, fueling issues and engine problems. It was set to be the first flight in NASA's quest to return to the moon. Now it could be days, even weeks before another attempt is possible. Millions in the Midwest placed under alerts for potentially dangerous thunderstorms and powerful winds. Meanwhile, Mississippi is facing the threat of more flooding. Ginger Z is tracking several storm systems tonight and watching activity in the tropics. Gunfire at a grocery store. Police say an armed man entered the store and started firing, killing at least two people. Investigators say one of the victim's actions may have saved lives. New developments in the document seized from former President Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate. The Justice Department says it's finished going through the documents and highlighted some materials it found, what the discovery could mean for the legal battle. The nationwide teacher shortage. School districts across the country are scrambling to staff classrooms as educators leave their jobs with many blaming low pay and limited resources. I was just angry a lot because I was like, I can't believe we're doing this. Like this is not helping the kids. One of the worst natural disasters in the history of the United States, 17 years after Hurricane Katrina, we're getting a glimpse at how it impacted the lives of some of the youngest survivors at the time. The creator of HBO's documentary, Katrina Babies, describes those harrowing scenes we'll never forget and how the trauma still lingers. It's important that we start these conversations and teach them and I give them the tools to, uh, to uh, deal with their trauma once it's surfacing. And Serena Williams back on the court for her final major tournament. Millions are rooting for the tennis great as she tries one more time to tie the record for most Grand Slam wins. We take a look back at her extraordinary career. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Kana Whitworth. I'm here in Los Angeles in for Lindsay Davis. And thank you so much for streaming with us. And tonight, as many are trying to soak in those last few days of summer, millions are facing multiple days of severe weather threats. So we are tracking flooding, extreme heat, and possible hurricanes tonight. In the Midwest, damaging winds hitting 80 miles an hour, leaving a quarter of a million people without power. This is time-lapse video of a storm moving through Chicago. Now that same system is fueling this funnel cloud in Minnesota. And in the deep south, there is a state of emergency following flooding in Mississippi that has forced residents to evacuate. And in the bone dry southwest, Temperatures could soar this week to nearly 115 degrees in some places, sparking excessive heat warnings and new fire concerns. All of this while we continue to watch the tropics and what has been a quiet hurricane season so far. Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z is standing by. She's tracking this all. But first, Trevor Alt leads us off from Mississippi. Tonight, though, severe storms slamming the Midwest. The leading edge of this is what's producing winds of 50 to 60 miles per hour. Snapping trees in the Chicago suburbs, this time lapse showing the front moving through the city. Well, in the deep south, after those record rains, the Pearl River near Jackson finally cresting this morning just below major flood stage. This is the Barnett Reservoir. It is filled to the brim from all that extreme rainfall last week, and they're trying to do a controlled release. As much as 60,000 cubic feet of water pouring into the Pearl River every second and just downstream. You can see for yourself, River Road looks like a river this morning. This neighborhood is completely underwater. Residents in vulnerable neighborhoods heeding officials' warnings to get out. Ruby Bingham evacuating Sunday morning. My kids made me come out this morning. Mama, you got to go today. We can't wait till tomorrow. And Trevor Alt is joining us now from Mississippi. So, Trevor, the good news, it sounds like here, is that the river has, in fact, crested. But now that waiting game starts. And that's right, Kata. So this is a situation that definitely could have been a lot worse. I mean, the governor prematurely declared that state of emergency because we were anticipating there was going to be much more flooding than we actually saw. But, of course, still around here, we've had a lot of flooding at this baseball stadium. At the same time, it's also going to take a while for all of this water to recede here. Even though the Pearl River has crested, it could be days, even the rest of the week, before it gets out of flood stage. Kana? Okay, Trevor, our thanks to you. And now to our chief meteorologist, Ginger Z is tracking the severe weather and also the severe weather we're seeing in the tropics as well. Hey, Ginger. 
Hey there, Kana. Let's start with the severe thunderstorms, which brought 81 mile per hour gusts to a place like Lowell, Indiana, and are headed east to the northeast for tomorrow. But let's start with that severe thunderstorm watch that we just got up that includes Champaign, Illinois, Quincy, Illinois, Peoria, and Springfield. Toledo is just getting hit now with the first line. As this stuff marches east, it's going to get a little quieter in the morning, as it always does, and then it'll heat up with the daytime heating. That sunshine gets everything going, and then we'll start to open up the skies again. It looks like eastern Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York get it late afternoon through the evening hours. So we'll be watching in case those end up having damaging winds in included. But then the tropics. We are less than two weeks from the peak of hurricane season, which is September 10th climatologically. And the Atlantic Ocean is saying, well, I'm ready to warm up because it has been so quiet. 57th day in a row, Kana, that we have had no named storms. That's the third longest stretch in history. Uh, but that 80% you see on the map there, that could potentially get us one in the next couple of days. We'll be watching where it goes and what it would do way next week uh, in the coming days. Okay, Ginger, thank you so much. Potentially quite literally the quiet before the storm. Our thanks to you. Thank you. And now to the deadly supermarket shooting in Bend, Oregon. Tonight, we have learned it was an employee at the Safeway who was killed while trying to disarm the gunman. Authorities say he likely saved lives. ABC's Elwin Lopez is on the scene. Tonight, police say a heroic act by one grocery store worker might have saved dozens inside an Oregon supermarket. The first calls coming in around 7 p.m. Sunday evening. An active threat currently at Safeway. We have multiple victims inside Safeway. Officials say the alleged gunman, 20-year-old Ethan Blair Miller, lived nearby and started firing an AR-15-style rifle as he walked across his parking lot and shopping center. The gunman then made his way into this Safeway, shooting and killing an 84-year-old customer, now identified as Glenn Edward Bennett. The shooter shot one person. Uh, that person was transported by medics, but is now deceased. The shooter continued through Safeway firing. Me and three other employees ran into a walk-in refrigerator and closed the door and stayed there. But police say one employee, 66-year-old Donald Ray Surratt, took action, trying to disarm the shooter in the produce section before he was killed. Without his intervention and without him physically confronting the shooter, it could have been very tragic. At 7.08 p.m., just four minutes after those first 911 calls, officers entering the grocery store, finding the gunman dead of an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound, the AR-15 style rifle, and a shotgun next to his body. I think the combination of someone fighting back and causing disruption, as well as the officers immediately there, and that person knew the officers were inside the store, and there was really no other option for him. So thanks to both of those actions, you would say, is why the shooting stopped? Absolutely. And that was Elwin Lopez reporting for us tonight. Also, there are these new questions surrounding sexual assault allegations against an NFL rookie punter who was released over the weekend. The question's here. If the apparent incident happened nearly a year ago, how did the Buffalo Bills and the league not know? And why haven't criminal charges been filed? Well, now the alleged victim and her father are speaking out. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has the story. Tonight, tough questions for the Buffalo Bills after rookie punter Matt Ariza was released from the team over the weekend after he was accused of raping a teenager while in college. At this time, we just think it's the best move for everyone to move on from Matt. A lawsuit filed last week accuses Ariza, along with two former teammates, of raping a 17-year-old at an off-campus Halloween party at San Diego State University last fall. The accuser speaking to KPBS. They threw me down onto the bed, uh, face down, and they took turns um, assaulting me. The alleged attack lasting about an hour and a half. The teen's father says she went to the police and the hospital. His attorney asked that we blur his face to protect his daughter's identity. She'll carry this with her for the rest of her life. As for Ariza, his attorney calling the lawsuit a shakedown. He is 100% adamant that he never forcibly raped this young lady. The Buffalo Bills say they didn't know about the allegations when they drafted Ariza and that they were recently made aware of a civil complaint. ABC News has learned the teen's lawyer was in contact with the Bills in late July after Ariza joined the team. 
And that was Eva Pilgrim reporting for us tonight. Also, there is new video from Ukraine, and it's adding to the fears for Europe's largest nuclear plant. The footage is now circulating online. What you're seeing here is the aftermath of an attack nearby. So the damage to the roof of the building at the plant, right there, a Russian-backed official is saying Ukraine is to blame. And now a UN nuclear team is in Ukraine in an attempt to avoid a catastrophe here. ABC's Britt Clinton has more. Tonight, Ukraine launching a dramatic new counteroffensive in the south. A defiant President Zelensky telling the Ukrainian people, we are taking it all back saying, I'm sure you all understand what is happening. Going on to list the regions they will reclaim from the Russians. Ukraine is returning its own, and it will return the Kharkiv region, Luhansk region, Donetsk region, Zaporizhia, Kherson, Crimea, adding of the Russians, quote, the occupiers should know we will oust them to the border. And tonight, the other troubling flashpoint, the clearest evidence yet of just how dangerously close Ukraine is coming to a nuclear disaster. New images released by a Russian-backed official showing the damage caused by shelling at Europe's largest nuclear power plant. You can see a gaping hole in the roof of a building just 300 feet from one of the reactors. This new satellite picture showing that damaged building. The Pentagon tonight saying most of the shelling is from the Russians. The Ukrainians firing back and aware of the danger as they try to aim away from the plant. And tonight, UN inspectors have arrived in Ukraine today with plans to visit that plant in the coming days and calling for a controlled shutdown of the nuclear plant. And here on the ground, a Ukrainian doctor telling me he's preparing his patients for the worst. We worked with some people who were exposed after the Chernobyl. They still have tremendous uh, health problems. It's, of course, frightening to some extent. Frightening. Of course. To have to deal with this in 2022, it's unheard of. Natalie Gorbets and her children escaping their nearby village, saying she's terrified not just of a radiation risk, but of Russian soldiers. What are you telling your kids about what you guys are doing and, and the fact that you had to leave home? It's the Russians who forced us out, fighting back tears, saying she now has to start from scratch. The UN inspectors coming into this country to check out the Zaporizhia plant, which is about 35 miles from where I'm standing. That's welcome news to the people around this area who are living in constant fear of a radiation emergency. Kena? Britt Clinton, our thanks to you. And now tonight, we go to the battle over the document seized at Mar-a-Lago. Former President Trump's lawyer has asked for a special master to see if any of these privileged documents may have been found. But the Department of Justice says They've already been through them, and they've actually put aside any in question. It comes amid an assessment of the potential risk to national security from these classified documents that were left unsecured. ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, has the latest. Former President Trump has asked a federal judge to name a special master to review the documents seized from Mar-a-Lago and weed out privileged information. But today, the Justice Department is saying it's already done that work and has set aside a limited set of materials that potentially contain attorney-client privileged information. It comes after Judge Aileen Cannon, a Trump appointee, indicated she's inclined to grant his request for a special master. Team Trump waited weeks after the FBI search to ask for a special master, an especially long time. FBI officials had removed 11 sets of classified documents, and that's on top of 184 classified documents Trump handed over in January. 92 of them marked secret, and 25 marked top secret. Now, in another major move involving those documents, the federal government is beginning to assess the possible damage done by Trump's decision to bring them to his Florida resort. The director of national intelligence saying officials will look at the potential risk to national security that will result from the disclosure of that information. The Justice Department says the documents include information about clandestine human sources, in other words, spies and informants, whose lives could be endangered if their identities were revealed. And Pierre Thomas is joining us now from Washington. So, Pierre, the Florida judge hears arguments Thursday on whether to name a special master, but the Justice Department says it's sort of already done essentially what the special master would do. They've gone ahead and identified a, quote, limited set of materials that potentially contain attorney-client privilege. So, in essence, where does this leave the investigation? 
Well, some are saying this is just a smokescreen by yeah. Trump to slow things down. But what the FBI cares about is not a question of privilege, but all those classified documents that they claim contain some of our very most important secrets. That's what they care about. All right, Pierre, our thanks to you. And now tonight, NASA's mission to the moon is on hold. An engine problem scrubbed the Artemis mission's first test launch this morning. NASA had been waiting 50 years to resume flights to the moon. And tonight, that wait will be a little bit longer. ABC's Gio Benitez reports for us from the Kennedy Space Center. Tonight scrubbed two major issues on the launch pad, forcing NASA's launch director to delay the highly anticipated Artemis 1 launch to the moon. A scrub for today. Issue number one, one of the four engines wasn't cooling down to the proper temperature. That's a critical step to avoid a catastrophic launch. That is the whole reason for this test flight, to make sure it's as safe as possible. That engine has flown on six shuttle missions starting in 2006. But right now, engineers do not believe the engine needs to be replaced. Issue number two, a crack in a vent valve in the inner tank. If we can resolve this operationally out at the pad in the next 48 hours, 72 hours, Friday is definitely in play. This test launch will be the first time the most powerful rocket in the world takes flight, sending the Orion capsule into space to orbit the moon and make sure it's safe for astronauts in 2024. It's been 12 years in the making with an estimated end price tag of $93 billion. Today, Vice President Harris at Kennedy Space Center pressed on the large amount. The return on an investment for space exploration and being able to put human beings on the moon where they can work and live is going to be immense. And Gio Benitez joins us now from Cape Canaveral. So Gio, a lot of disappointment this morning. So lay it out for us here. What is the best case scenario now? And also, of course, for NASA, what is the worst case scenario? Yeah, so Kena, the best case scenario would be that that rocket stays on that launch pad and that they're able to fix the issues over the next 48 to 72 hours. That is the best case scenario because then we're looking at a potential Friday launch. They say Friday is absolutely on the table if that's the case. If that is not the case and they actually have to move that rocket off the launch pad back to the assembly building, we are potentially looking at a delay of weeks, maybe even months, depending on what the issue is. But tomorrow they will look at all of the issues, and they're going to look at it very, very closely with fresh eyes to see what they can do, Kano. Wow, Gio. Okay, a lot of high hopes then for the end of the week. We appreciate you, Gio. Well, when we come back here, it's a heart-stopping moment. Ten-year-old boy jumping into a pool to save his mother from drowning. Also, Britney Spears speaks out about her controversial conservatorship, the allegations she made against her family in a now deleted audio recording. And school districts nationwide are struggling to fill a teacher shortage. Educators have said they are overwhelmed and underpaid. Maria Villarreal speaks to some about their decision to leave the classroom. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Okay, we made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. 
as of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCnews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCnews.com. And here's to everything ahead. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on the tough questions with straightforward reporting. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back, everybody. Take a look at that an explosive end to twin skyscrapers near New Delhi, India. Both of them are 338 feet tall. They were buildings that were illegally built, so they were brought down in just seconds. Police are now checking to ensure that any of those properties nearby were not damaged. Wow. As the fall school year kicks into high gear, much of the country, many schools are facing a shortage of teachers unlike any they have ever seen before. So what is driving so many teachers to leave the profession? And what are the school districts doing to try and retain and recruit educators? ABC's Maria Villarreal takes a look. I think the kids liked me. I really connected with them. So I think I could like talk to them and I got to know them really well. The boys were hilarious. I have pictures of doing like TikToks with the kids like at lunch because I think I was a very approachable teacher. So I got really close with them. KJ Larson started teaching at a charter school straight out of college, eventually moving into Denver's public school system as a business teacher. I really wanted to have like a positive impact on my community, especially at that point in my life. Like I really want to invest in like the people around me and like help where I'm living. But several family members, including her parents, who were teachers themselves, warned the 23 year old to stay away from the profession, encouraging her to find another job that was more flexible with better pay. And I think they were like, you can't really like keep what you like to do and like living in Colorado, like on that salary, like was just so exhausted all the time. And I just think she's like, why would you like go into a career like that? And then you still did it. And I still did it. Okay, so we're not Then a year into her teaching career, the pandemic hit. Educators were being asked to do more with limited resources. KJ stayed on, but she began to struggle. So I thought I would work there forever because a lot of teachers do. Like the average teacher at South has probably been there like, 10 years and a lot of people retire there like so what happened um so many things i think my rent increased exponentially <laughs> that was like a big one okay. like 48 percent um and i could no longer afford to live in denver and i got nervous that i wouldn't be able to like support myself on my own. KJ tried to make extra money by taking on a waitress job and doing taxes for nonprofit groups on the side, but it wasn't enough. The pressures of teaching in the pandemic also weighed heavily on her. I had like 200 students at South, and so I just didn't know them as well. I didn't feel like as connected. I care a lot about education, and I think I was just angry a lot because I was like, I can't believe we're doing this. Like, this is not helping the kids. This isn't helping me, like, in the classroom. Um, and I just couldn't do it. I didn't want to be an old grumpy teacher. And I have seen a lot of those. <laughs> How long know. did you last at that school? Only two years. And then I quit. KJ is now working as an accountant with better pay and more flexibility. 
Across the country, there's a steady drumbeat of headlines about a nationwide shortage of teachers as the new school year kicks off. As school starts across our area, there's growing concern about who will be there to teach students. CCSD has been making a big push to hire more teachers. The only question, will they have a teacher? In Oregon, they're looking for 2,500 teachers across the state. Deploying out any of our non-teaching staff that were licensed in various areas or even those non-licensed folks to fill in for classified staff were getting pushed out to schools to help out just to keep the doors open. Leaders in Florida recruiting veterans and retired first responders into the classroom. Some of them are looking for kind of the next chapter in their life. Same with the military. So we want to provide a pathway. We want to incentivize them being able to help. Wisconsin administrators also trying to think outside the box as they tackle their own shortage. We've just pulled out a retired teacher in one of those areas that's going to work this year. Um, we've looked at people who don't have teaching degrees who come in and we put them to work. Top leaders warning the problem isn't going away. A lot of good teachers have left and they are leaving. The exodus is still happening. Around 300,000 public school teachers and other staff members have left the field since the beginning of the pandemic, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. That's a 3% drop. And according to a National Education Association survey, lingering stress from the COVID pandemic and burnout topped the list of issues facing educators, followed by unfilled job openings leading to more work for remaining staff and low pay. After more than five years teaching in Colorado, Colin Creasel left his full-time position teaching Spanish earlier this year, his anxiety and exhaustion hitting an all-time high. This last school year, I don't think I've done my best teaching since the beginning of COVID. It's very draining to not have any good days. My good days used to be like, man, that kid was really struggling with like this grammar concept, but then they like stayed after school one day and they nailed it. Or like, I had a student like reach out for like help with like their social emotional needs. Like that's rewarding. That like stopped happening once COVID. Creasel is now subbing until he finds his next career. I've been considering going into like landscape architecture, urban planning. And just while I figure that out, and even if I'm like back in school, I might just take up a sub job. But I don't plan on doing it like full time. I'm like trying to just get out and I'm like qualified, really well qualified to do it. Um, but it's not like I have committed to not being a teacher anymore. Denver's public school system recently hired superintendent is spearheading incentives to help the district retain and attract employees with signing bonuses and increased pay. Still, the district isn't immune to the teacher shortage, with the cost of living a major factor driving teachers away. So it impacts not only our work uh, staff, but our overall enrollment, which devastates the school system, uh, but also when it comes to our teachers. I've explored um, the whole notion of trying to come up with uh, new educator housing, but I also know that this is not a DPS Denver issue. I've spoken to my colleagues in El Paso and Austin, which is very similar to, to DPS in terms of what, uh, how it attracts others, but also the, the cost of living. I think it needs to be addressed at the national level. According to the Department of Education, the average salary of a teacher is 33% less than college graduates in other fields. Education Secretary Miguel Cardona is pushing in the short term to use American Rescue Plan dollars as an incentive to bring back retired teachers without penalty to their retirement benefits and to create grow your own programs. The fact that we've normalized teachers working at Uber on the weekends or, or having to waitress on the weekends to make ends meet is unacceptable. You know, the salary right now doesn't measure up. It doesn't measure up. We have to do better with salary, working condition, uh, working conditions and teacher voice. Back in Denver, as school starts up again, KJ admits she's already missing her students. She's hopeful for them that all these new changes work. So what do you say to college students that have chosen this as their major? They, they're thinking about being teachers next year. Yeah, I say be prepared to kind of struggle um, financially. I would also say like prepare for probably like three to four years of it being very emotionally draining. This sounds hard. Yeah, it's like it, you have to think, I think, 
I would tell a college kid to think long term. I would probably tell them not to major in it because you can study something else and still be a teacher and then have a fallback option. Is that crazy to say that you have to have a fallback option if you want to be a teacher? It's pretty cynical. I feel kind of bad about it, but I think it's realistic. Wow, and our thanks to uh, ABC's Maria Villarreal for that. I'm still ahead here. Drones near the airport. How authorities are attempting to crack down on these objects before tragedy strikes. Also, we take a look at a facility that just received a major investment to become the first to manufacture monkeypox vaccines in the U.S. And Serena Williams begins her final push for a Grand Slam title, and we take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day from MV, uh, MTV. Playing a clip of Bad Bunny's performance last night on the VMAs, he became the first non-English act to ever win that network's Artist of the Year. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated abcnews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at abcnews.com. And here's to everything ahead. And welcome back. We are nearing the end of an era. Tennis phenom Serena Williams' appearance at the U.S. Open this week will be her last Grand Slam. And as she prepares for retirement, we take a look at how she has smashed the competition over the years by the numbers. Williams has won 23 Grand Slams, putting her just one win shy of tying the record. And sticking with 23, it was 23 years ago that she won the U.S. Open, marking her first Grand Slam victory. The ace player has spent more than 300 weeks of her career as the number one player in the world, according to the World Tennis Association. Williams' signature serve has helped her win Wimbledon seven times. It's also the number of times that she has won the Australian Open, including a win in 2017 when she was pregnant with her daughter Olympia. Now she enters the U.S. Open this year as a six-time winner in singles competitions, but she's also teaming up with another tennis great for this year's doubles competition, of course her sister Venus. Together they have won 14 Grand Slam championships in doubles as a team, and throughout her career Williams has won more than 1,000 games and has earned her the nickname The Goat, greatest of all time. Time, of course, and she has also helped bring home more than $94 million in prize money. In fact, she is ranked on Forbes' list of richest self-made women with a $260 million estimated net worth. Earlier this month, 40-year-old Williams announced she would be evolving away from tennis to pursue her business endeavors and to expand her family. 
Well, we have a lot to get to here tonight on Prime. Staying with us and staying with tennis, he could be America's best hope at capturing a men's major title for the first time since 2003. Taylor Fritz talks about growing up with the sport and his high hopes for the U.S. Open. Plus, when you can get a movie ticket for just three bucks. First, though, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Increasing concerns over potential damage to national security following the FBI search of former President Trump's Florida estate. ABC News has learned the Director of National Intelligence has sent a letter to top congressional lawmakers confirming an assessment is underway. That heavily redacted affidavit used in the search of Mar-a-Lago released Friday, revealing some critical details. The FBI launched the search in part on evidence from a significant number of civilian witnesses. The Justice Department warning that as the investigation continues, key witnesses could face intimidation or retaliation. There is an ongoing grand jury investigation and prosecutors have already identified potential targets and are looking for more. The FBI has found documents involving the most sensitive of classified material, including some on human intelligence, spies, electronic eavesdropping, and secrets from allies. Former President Trump fighting back. A hearing is set for later this week on his request for a Florida federal court to name a special master, a third-party expert to review the FBI seized evidence from Mar-a-Lago. The U.S. government is turning to Michigan to help stop the spread of monkeypox. $11 million is being invested into a facility in Grand Rapids. That money will help the facility produce the vaccine that is currently exclusive to Denmark. Production at that Grand Rapids facility is expected to begin before the end of the year. Currently, there's over 17,000 monkeypox cases in the U.S. New York State accounts for over 3,000 of them. A shooting spree in Detroit has left three people dead and an 80-year-old man and his dog injured. Police say a 19-year-old appears to have fired on each of his victims unprovoked while moving through the community. 
He first shot a man in his 20s and then separately two women in their 40s before shooting the elderly man walking his dog. The chief says the man may have been suffering from mental illness. We are early in this investigation, but we are confident, we are confident uh, that the suspect that we have in custody is in fact uh, our suspect uh, on, on these cases. A rookie running back for the Washington Commanders has been shot in what police in D.C. say may have been an attempted carjacking. Rookie running back Ryan Robinson was shot several times Sunday. Team says the injuries are not life-threatening. After drone sightings and even reports of a man flying with a jetpack around Los Angeles International Airport, the federal government is rolling out new tech that could better detect objects entering restricted airspace. The project called the Unmanned Aircraft Systems Test Bed Program is the second of its kind nationwide and will begin testing technology designed to detect, track, and identify drones entering the airspace of LAX. This year alone, there have been about 38 drones visually detected at the airport, including one that was reported within 700 feet of an aircraft just before Super Bowl 56. TSA notes that the data collected at LAX will help expand the program to other airports, as well as raise awareness of the risks of entering restricted airspace. Movie theaters are hoping to fill seats with a special one-day $3 ticket offer. Theater is launching National Cinema Day September 3rd. Major chains including AMC and Regal joining Hollywood Studios to bring moviegoers back into theaters. Shows will include trailers for upcoming releases. Well, now to Britney Spears speaking about her conservatorship, calling it all a setup. Setup. It was in a 20-minute audio clip, and she posted it on YouTube, but then she deleted it. ABC's Zorin Shah has the story. Britney Spears dropping a dramatic tell-all, speaking out about her family and the conservatorship, which controlled her life for more than 13 years. I haven't wanted to share this because it's unbelievably offensive, sad, abusive. And honestly, would anybody believe me? I felt like I was in a state of shock, almost like when an old person feels helpless. In a 22-minute YouTube and Twitter video, which has since been removed, Spears remembering the beginning of her conservatorship. I was extremely young. I honestly, still to this day, don't know what really I did. I literally spoke in a British accent to a doctor to prescribe my medication, and three days later, there was a swap team. In my home, none of it makes sense. In the candid video, Spears slamming her father, saying what he did was punishment and detailing the fraught relationship with her family. The whole thing that made it really confusing for me is these people are on the street fighting for me, but my sister and my mother aren't doing anything. I couldn't process how my family went along with it for so long. And their only response was... We didn't know. I felt like my family threw me away. I was performing for like thousands of people. I was a machine. Her sister, Jamie Lynn Spears, telling Juju Chang earlier this year the conservatorship was put in place when she was just a teenager. I was 17 year old. I was about to have a baby. I understand just as little about it then as I do now. Overnight, their mom, Lynn Spears, posting on Instagram, writing, Brittany, your whole life, I've tried my best to support your dreams and wishes. And also, I've tried my best to help you out of hardships. I love you so much, but this talk is for you and me only, eye to eye, in private. Since Brittany's conservatorship ended last November, she married her longtime love, Sam Ashgari, who exclusively told GMA about tying the knot. It's been a minute. It was way overdue for us, and uh, we imagined this thing being a fairy tale, and it was. The megastar also returning to her music roots, teaming up with Sir Elton John. Hold me close, Last week, releasing her first new song in five years. Spears says she's speaking out now, hoping to help others. I haven't honestly shared this openly too as well because i've always been scared of the judgment and definitely the embarrassment of just of the whole thing period and the skepticism and the cynical people i do think i'm in a place now where i'm a little bit more confident that i can be willing to share openly my thoughts it was one of the worst natural disasters in the history of the United States. Hurricane Katrina claimed more than 1,800 lives. The storm and subsequent flooding displaced more than a million people in the Gulf Coast region. 
roughly 80% of Metro New Orleans was flooded, causing $125 billion in damages, many areas still not repaired. And today marks 17 years since Katrina. Children who experienced that trauma are adults now. And New Orleans educator and filmmaker Edward Buckles Jr., who was just 13 himself when that storm hit, has documented their stories for the HBO documentary film Katrina Babies, which debuted August 24th on HBO and HBO Max. So let's take a look. Hurricane Katrina caused one of the biggest disbursements of black people in history. After losing so much, why wouldn't anyone ask if we were okay? Nobody ever asked the children how they were doing. So I am. Such a crucial question. Joining us now is Edward Buckles Jr. Edward, thank you so much for taking time to be with us. Yeah, ab absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. So you were just 13 when Katrina hit, and you said that it was your mother who ultimately made the decision to evacuate the family just in the nick of time. But along with many of your f peers in that storm, it changed your life. But these stories have somewhat been overlooked, so why share it now? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I think that as we are sitting here on the 17 year anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, um, I think that it's, you know, it's, 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 it's incredible how many young people um, who experienced that storm still have not spoken about it. You know, mm -hmm. this film is only doing a small piece of the justice that needs to be done and the uh, impact that needs to be had. The documentary begins with this archived footage of the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. You see the city inundated with these floodwaters. You see people, primarily young kids, that are being helicoptered off rooftops. As you were making this, was it hard to go back and, and look at that video? I mean, I'm, I'm even getting chills right now. Oh, yeah, it's 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 incredibly difficult. You know, yeah. um, I'm, I'm I'm super close to this footage. I'm super close to this project, the ideas, the uh, topics, you know, many people in this footage, you know, I, I, I actually know. So it was definitely, you know, um, important that I take care of myself while I was making this film. But I also thought that it was important that we, you know, put some of this footage to use so that we can really see what happened in 2005 when it came to black people in New Orleans. The term resilient, it gets thrown around a lot when talking about kids and how they're affected by trauma. Sometimes, though, when you use the word resilient, a childhood trauma could be overlooked because you say the kids are, in fact, so resilient. So in this documentary, you touch on this, that in America, you said, especially during a disaster, black children are not even a thought. You went on to say that Hurricane Katrina was no different. So tell me what you mean. Yeah. You know, there's a double-edged sword of resilience. You know, I mm -hmm. think that I think that being resilient is something that we should be absolutely proud of. We should celebrate it, and we should we should we should lean on it when we need to. But I do think that it's dangerous when it's used in the wrong hands. You know, I think that sometimes when it's when it's being you know um, I guess projected towards us, it makes us steer away from who needs to be held accountable. What do you hope to see for the future of not just Katrina babies, but also the ways in which we consistently care for our youth during times of crisis? I just, you know, I just hope that we just talk to the children and like and like start conversations with the children, even if we, you know, feel that they may not understand what's going on, you know, in that moment. It's important that we start these conversations and teach them and like give them the tools to uh, to uh, deal with their trauma once it's servicing. You know, right now we're in a pandemic, you know, so how is this pandemic impacting the children? You know, I, I think that years from now, you know, I don't want another film, you know, to have to come out like this to start a conversation years later. We should be doing that right now. Yeah, let our kids have a voice, right? Absolutely. Edward, yeah, thank you so much for joining us, Edward. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. And Katrina Babies is available to stream on HBO Max. We are also tracking several headlines around the world at this hour. Continued devastation for Pakistan after monsoon rains and flooding have killed at least 75 people in the last 24 hours. The Asian nation has been on the receiving end of fatally brutal rains and natural disasters. Since mid-June, over 1,100 people have died and more than a million homes have been destroyed there. Pakistan's federal minister for climate change said 
that a third of Pakistan is underwater, with one small town receiving nearly 70 inches of rain in a single day. Also, the sister-in-law of the Peruvian president, Pedro Castillo, was given 30 months of pre-trial detention, the most serious escalation so far in a host of criminal investigations that have targeted the leader's inner circle. Prosecutors allege that she was part of a group that assigned public contracts to allies of the president in his home region. Castillo, who has been in office for 13 months, is besieged by scandals and has already survived two impeachment attempts. Prosecutors have opened six criminal investigations against him. Also, a lion at a zoo in Ghana mauled a man to death after he entered its enclosure. A security official on a routine patrol noticed a middle-aged man had climbed over the tall mesh fence enclosing a lion, a lioness, and two cubs. His motivation is yet to be determined, and authorities are investigating that incident. Okay, so maybe it's hard to believe, but there just might be a silver lining if you are laid off right now. Many people who lost their jobs are finding new ones that actually pay better. ABC's Rebecca Jarvis has the story that we first saw in the Wall Street Journal. Oh, hi there, I'm Suki, and I got laid off this Tuesday with a third of the company. When Suki Lon was laid off from her copywriter job at a fintech startup, she wasted no time marketing herself, posting this creative video to LinkedIn two days later. No, mom, this is not the perfect opportunity for me to go to law school. Promoting her colleagues also affected by the layoff. They are more talented than Taylor Swift and basically the Avengers superheroes of their field. A lot of us felt blindsided by the layoffs. I remember feeling really scared and I thought, okay, What's a way that I can get my colleagues' names in front of as many people as possible? So I approached it in the best way I knew how. While also advertising her own skills. Also, I'm a copywriter. That so video bringing troves of recruiters knocking on her virtual door. The next day I woke up and my LinkedIn inbox was full. Um, I had tons of people wanting to connect with me. Despite record high inflation, the jobs market is still tight with about two job openings for every unemployed person. The job market is slowing, but it's actually still a job seekers market. What we're finding is that we're actually above those pre-COVID levels, so it is still a good time to find a job. If you've been laid off, experts recommend following Suki's lead. Do reach out to your network, emphasize your skills, and apply early. The stigma of saying that you're looking for a job has changed, and that is making it easier for people to find a job. If you're comfortable, put a post up, talk about this with your network, and be really specific about the skills that you have and the job that you're looking for. And once you score that interview, don't speak negatively about your past employer and don't cover up the layoff. Focus on what you bring to the table, why you're the best candidate. And you want to focus on the future and not focus on the past. As for Suki, two and a half weeks later, she scored an even better job. This new opportunity for me is something that I really enjoy doing. It's a senior level position and it's higher compensation. All right, our thanks to Rebecca Jarvis for that. And now to a quick thinking 10 year old who actually saved his mom from drowning in a pool. The whole thing is caught on camera. ABC's Ariel Reshef has the story. An Oklahoma mom crediting her little boy was saving her life. The remarkable rescue caught on home surveillance video. We were having a wonderful morning and we thought we'd jump in the pool. Lori Keeney was in her backyard swimming pool when the 44-year-old who has epilepsy suddenly suffered a seizure. Oh, I heard a splashing and drowning-ish, and then I looked, and then she was seizing in the pool. Her son, Gavin, who was on the porch, wasting no time. You can see him climb the ladder and dive in to save her from drowning. I scared a little bit. The 10-year-old lifting his mom's chin above the water, paddling backward with her in his arms to the side of the pool until his grandpa, who lives next door, arrives to help. I saw my dad and I just threw myself into his arms. Relief as the three embrace in a hug. This could have killed me. I would have drowned if he was not out there. And that was terrifying. The Kingston Police Department honoring Gavin for his heroism, presenting him with an award for bravery. A mom forever grateful for her courageous son. He is definitely my hero, but I really do feel like he's my guardian angel as well. 
Wow, what quick thinking by that young man. And our thanks to Ariel Russia for that story. And finally tonight, with the U.S. Open getting underway, all eyes are also on 24-year-old American rising tennis star Taylor Fritz. ABC News contributor LZ Granderson caught up with Taylor ahead of the tournament. Growing up with professional tennis players as parents, it's no surprise rising tennis star Taylor Fritz found his hands on a racket at just two years old. I mean, it was around so much, it was pretty impossible for me, like, not to get into tennis, you know? Like, we had one room, kind of like pantry room in the house, it was just all rackets. <laughs> you had a racket room in your house? There's just rackets, yeah. <laughs> You have a five-year-old? Yeah. Has he gone into the racket room yet and picked up a racket? Don't have a racket room, unfortunately, <laughs> but um, I gave him my own, <laughs> my, my racket. It's cool that I can hand my son my own racket. We get on the court, hit some. Is he good already? He's all right, you know, <laughs> he's, he's picking it up. The hardest thing for me as a young dad was spending time away from him. You're on tour. How are you managing that? It's, it's really tough, you know? At the end of the day, like, I can't, I can't give up my, my career <laughs> to be there all the time, even though I want to. And uh, I've just learned a lot about time management and trying to spend as much time as possible with him when I can. From winning the U.S. Open junior title in 2015 to top-ranked American man, Taylor has gone from curiosity to the country's best hope of capturing its first men's major title since Andy Roddick in 2003. Something happened last year, and you've become like this totally different player, and you're seeing in the results. You had a career high ranking now, you're at, you're at number 12 now in the world. Do you know what it was? Yeah. Like, what clicked? I think the biggest change in my game was my forehand. I just started being way more aggressive with it. It just became so much more of a weapon that I could rely on. And it certainly seems to be paying off. The winner. This spring, Taylor defeated Rafael Nadal, becoming the first American man to win the Indian Wales title since Andre Agassi did it in 2001. Taylor Fritz is the king in California. When I think of Rafa, I just think of his legacy. This is a guy I grew up watching when I was 12 years old. It's crazy to even be playing against him, competing with him for titles. Despite a stress fracture in his foot, Taylor has been playing the best tennis of his life and comes to the U.S. Open seated in the top 10, leading many to believe he has a good shot to win it all. I actually believe he can win this tournament. I think this year, the U.S. Open, there's about 10, 15 guys that can win the tournament, and he's one of them. Um, it's more open, I think, than I've ever seen in the last 20 years. I think there's 12 to 15 that can win this, and, and Taylor, I'd put him maybe fifth on that list of guys that can win this tournament. I'm feeling really good. I'm playing really good tennis, and I just have to take the matches kind of one at a time. I think it's crazy to hear people talk about the fact that they think I could win the Open this year. When you think about the U.S. Open, it's hard, especially this year, not to think about the Williams sisters, particularly Serena Williams. When she says goodbye, there's going to be a huge void, a big gap here in America in terms of having a presence in tennis. Are you prepared to fill that void? I, I could never fill, I could never fill the role. You know, the thing is, there's so many really good young American players that I don't feel like it's gonna all be on me. It's an honor to have my name in that discussion and I think the future on the men's side is very bright. Oh, wow. Well. And before we go tonight, we have an image of the day for you. We stick with tennis, the U.S. Open back and Coco Golf clearly meaning business today. Oh, we love it. And that's our show for this hour. Please stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thank you so much for streaming with us. America's number one news, ABC.